good day, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, what a wonderful day. Well, today we are on week four, topic five. And today our lecture is going to be very, very much unique. Um, we're going to treat a very interesting topic, and the topic we're going to treat today is politics, power, and the influences of power towards social policies. See that? That is to say, when we talk about politics, it makes power possible. And when somebody gets power, this power people get forms in government. And definitely that influence policy. Let's see how we're going to treat these ones. Let me just give you a brief outline of the topic that we're going to be treating for today. We'll be looking at the background of the topic. We'll be looking at the meaning of politics and power. We'll be looking at the origin of politics. We'll be looking at the relationship between politics and power. We'll be looking at the forms of power. We'll be looking at the sources of power. We'll be looking at the role of government in policy making process. That is talking about the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. We will not be looking at theoretical perspectives that's propounded by scholars. For example, the philosopher King's theory by Plato. We're not going deep. We'll leave it for the political scientists, but we're going to be browsing and see how relevant it is to social work and to policy analysis. The Machiavellian perspective also, Thomas Hobbes' moral and political philosophy. These are the concepts we're going to be looking for today as we progress. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give you the background of this lecture. When we talk about politics, we talk about power, we talk about policy, the policies. These are very interesting concepts, and I'm sure every individual may want to understand what these concepts are talking about. No one can deny the fact that politics involves the struggle for power, and this power forms the gov government, and it is government that directly or indirectly influences the formulation of policies, like I said. Politics, mostly from a commonsensical perspective, somebody may say it has to do with the struggle for power. And when somebody gets power, the person has got legal framework, the individual has got the ability to enforce obedience, and that individual can easily influence policies. Let's see what happens. It is not a secret that the government in power determines the type of policies that are relevant for the well-being of citizens. I've said that can't wait a number of times. That the government that is in power determines the type of policies that are relevant for the effective functioning of society. That is a gentleman. The, the success of the government de depends on the type of policies instituted by that government. Since the government consists of three organs, that's the legislature, executive, and judiciary, the influence of these organs in policy formulation process cannot in any way be overemphasized. Definitely, we have the government, the executive, and judiciary. And these three work hand in hand to ensure that policies are formulated, to ensure that policies are implemented, to ensure that policies are successful. So, therefore, their significance cannot in any way be overemphasized. That is the influence. So, let's see what happens. When the government does not support a particular policy, there is a greater tendency for the policy to be regarded as a toothless bulldog. You see that? When a government comes to power and meets a policy in existence and does not want to support that policy, there is a tendency for that policy to be a toothless bulldog. It will be there, but will not be effective. It will be backing, but will not bite. That is what Dr. Kamar has always said. <laughs> Abdul Kamar, may God bless you. Of course, um, well, let's look at the concept of politics. Politics, of course, has several meanings given by various scholars. Man is a social animal. That one is not a secret. Most people know man is a social animal. He cannot live in isolation because he is not sufficient and he's not self-sufficient and the natural instinct to survive compels him to live a collective life. According to Aristotle, the collective, this collective life necessitates a political mechanism of rules, regulations, and leadership. An organized society needs some systems to make and enforce rules for orderly behavior in society. Therefore, man is also a political animal. Now we see, no matter how we look at it, society cannot progress without us engaging in pushing out interest. Society will become Nothing if politics is not in existence. The forefathers and founders of politics have laid a platform for what we call the maintenance of laws, for what we call the maintenance of power, for what we call progress in society. And politics is like a vehicle 
that carries the development of society. Politics is a vehicle that carries the progress and, and policies of society. Let's see. The term politics is derived from the Greek word polis, which means city state. According to Greek philosophers, politics was subject which deals with all activities and affairs of city state. It all started in Greek. We are city politics started in city states, in Greek city states. For them, city states mean just not just politics, but a lot of other things. However, let's leave that area for the politicians. We are social workers. Let's look at the origin of politics. The antecedent of Western politics can be traced, can, can, sorry, can trace their roots back to Greek thinkers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Sometimes I feel, you know, joy when I remember the great philosophers. It all started with Socrates, and several thinkers and analysts have given their opinion that the death of Socrates was as a result of his political intervention strategies. He has always got different opinions which were not accepted in Athens and Serb and Greek by then. However, Socrates was the one who laid the platform for what today call politics. But then he taught a student whose name is Plato. And Plato, who was the one who created the academy and wrote a book titled The Republic. In his book, The Republic, he has always used Socrates in what we call the Socratic thinking, the Socratic dialogue. Socrates has been his key character, and he has always loved Socrates. Plato loved him so much. And so, following the footsteps of his mentor, Plato helped us to understand that, indeed, politics is important for humans. Politics is important for society. Politics is a wheel that helps society to move on. And his own student, who was Aristotle, Aristotle by modern political scientists, they refer to him as the father of politics because of what he did, because of what he wrote. Anyway, that can be contradicted by political scientists, but thank God we are not political scientists. Let's progress. <laughs> uh, let's progress. Let's see what happens to the relationship between politics and power. Of course, there is no doubt that it is politics that leads to power. And without politics, power is impossible. So if you want to get power, it is just important that you involve yourself in politics. And you can get power in different ways. You can use different means to get power. So now we say power is the ability to determine the behavior of others in accordance with one's own wishes. The power theory of politics is as old as Greeks, though it has assumed much importance in recent times. See that? Power consists fundamentally of relationship of subordination or dominance and submission of the governors and the governed. And the study of politics involves the study of these relationships. A lot. So there is a relationship between power. So power has to do with the governed and those who are governed. And for you to be able to do that, you must have to be involved in politics. And that is why, as you progress, for those who study political scientists, they have a very good relationship of trying to ensure that they get power. Their own interest is, is how to control the state resources, how to ensure that these resources become there and they are able to control the affairs of the state. Anyway, <clears throat> progressing, what are the forms of power? Briefly, we cannot look at it, at the topic in detail, without me giving you an idea on the forms of power. There are different forms of power. Well, you can call them types. Well, one of them is political power. Political power, of course, is a power which is exercised by government in steering the affairs of the state. It normally comes from the constitution. For example, an elected president possess political power. When a president has been democratically elected by the people, that president possesses political power. And there is all the necessities for that president to use the constitution to rule. Number two, we have physical power. What is physical power? Well, several scholars will say lots, but let's, let me see from what we have here. It involves the use of physical force to compel obedience. The application of physical power causes pain, injury, and sometimes death to others because it is naked on the persons afflicted by others. We see that people sometimes, when they are not elected to, to actually 
take up on governance, but they do it by force. And definitely, when they take up on power, they will decide to force people at will to obey. And when that happens, they may inflict pain, they may inflict injuries, they may inflict suffering on the masses. That is physical because they believe that because they are capable of inflicting pain, they can take up on power of others. Number three, we have military power. <laughs> this form of power entails those with battle of guns. You see that? It, that, power, that power exercised by those who control or possess instruments that arm to others. You know, they are those in khaki uniform, military men, the soldiers. Mostly in Africa, one of the, the, the current phenomenon is military takeover, military intervention. The military individuals think they are competent in all, and they can be able to take up on the affairs of the state. Therefore, they mostly tend to interrupt a politically elected government or democratically elected government to take up on the leadership of the state, which is not correct. Number three, economic power. is the use of economic resources on a person or country by affluent countries to control the actions of others. For example, rich and powerful countries can easily influence the policies of weaker or poor nations or governments. You see that? We see that economic power mostly can be instituted when an individual has money and decides to use that money or resources to influence others. Some of us will obey even people because they are, they are richer and they can give us. And because they can give us, they can easily influence us to do what, what they want and will do it. So economic power is possible, and it happens to countries. Sometimes, so bigger countries like Sierra Leone can always be subjected to, to those big, bigger countries because we do not have money and need to go and borrow, need to, sorry, need to go and lend to them, etc. So a lot of these things, so let's see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, sources of power. A lot of ways people get power. I'm talking about, talking about sources, ways of acquisition of power. We talk about one, the constitution. We talk about political power. When somebody is elected to be in office, the person has possessed political, uh, sorry, the constitution. So now we have position of authority. Because you are the vice president, definitely when the president dies, you become a president. Your position of authority has given you power. So you see, some people, because of their positions, they can be able to influence decisions. Because they are ministers, etc. Through inheritance, like those who practice traditional power, for example, the paramount chief. The paramount chief died today, the son has the utmost right to overtake or to take up on power through charisma. Because you people believe I'm competent, I can deliver, I'll be able to work in the interest of the people, you love me so much, and you decide to give me power. That is charismatic power. The ability or the charisma or the, the extra quality somebody possesses, and as a result, the individual is given power. It is different from authority. Most of the people compare power to authority. No. Power cannot be delegated. You cannot look at power and delegate it. But authority can delegate it. That is why when Max Weber was explaining about his authority pattern, he made so three uh, authority patterns. We spoke about the traditional authority patterns, he spoke about the charismatic authority pattern, and that of the legal rational authority patterns, which we've treated in the past. Of course, uh, we now move to the role of government in policy making process. This one, I will summarize it. The role of governments in the policy making process cannot be overemphasized. And this is where the influence of the government towards policy formulation lies. In as much as government consists of the three organs of government, such as what? The legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And these three organs of government are powerful in such a way that they have the utmost tendency the, 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 to influence decisions. You know. Policies cannot be passed without the interventions of these three. Very, very important for us to note. You know, <coughs> let's see what happens. The, okay, now let's look at the legislature. The legislature is key because they are responsible for what? Policy legislation. No policy can pass without going through parliament. So you see? And if parliament decides, if the government does not support this policy, they will not even sign it. For example, you, you, we as social workers may decide that, okay, lesbians, homosexuals, these guys are important and therefore they should, we should legalize this because their right is paramount. But if this bill is sent to parliament and the government is not in support, they may not be able to approve it. So you see, their influence on policy, directly or indirectly, you know, has something to do with 
the ratification, the, the, the formulation of policies. We have to understand that. So Parliament, which is the legislature, has the right to legislate policies, amendment of the constitution. Sometimes they will look at the constitution and say this policy is no longer relevant. Let's take it out. This policy we need to include it. So you know they have a lot of influence in it. We have uh, uh, approval of presidential appointees. The president can only appoint, but the approval of presidential appointees is done by the legislature, which is very important. Approval of bodies. Now we are talking about formulating policies. Some of these policies need funds, and the government being the primary funder of these policies. This budget that is prepared by the executive is sent to where? And to the legislature. The legislature has the utmost power to, to approve this funding for policies. And they may decide, that, okay, this policy, we are not going to fund it. This policy will fund it. So you see, their influence on policy is very great. Now we see impeachment of the president. They may look at the president and say, this president is not is not only according to the constitution. In the constitution, there are policies he's supposed to go by. In the constitution, there are laws that he's supposed to go by. Because he has failed to rule by the constitution, because he has failed to follow good policies, because he has failed to, definitely, the president can be impeached through what we call a vote of non-confidence. He will just vote, he will give him a vote of non-confidence, and two-thirds of the majority, he will resign and call for another election. Well, political scientists can, can, can relate better. However, there are more other functions performed by the legislature. Let's look at the executive. Even though most people say that it, it's the second but most powerful organ of but most powerful organ of government is the executive. It, it is that organ which implements the laws passed by the legislature and the policies of the government. Most people and political scientists have actually viewed. Some say it is the legislature that is more powerful, which I tend to agree to like to a large extent because they have the utmost right to impeach the president. But again, a second thought will tell you that the growing powers of the executive direct influence on the performance of the legislature and that of the executive. Because recent studies have shown that because of the power, growing powers of the legislature, sorry, of the executive, they tend to overpower, they tend to ensure that they suppress the effective functioning of the of the judiciary and that of parliament. Now let's look at the functions of the executive briefly. One is to enforce the enforcement of laws. All this policy that we are passing, it is the executive that is responsible to influence its enforcement. For example, they have the executive consists of the police, the military, the prisons, etc. All these they fall under the executive arm of government. And these police, the, the army, and that of what the uh, prisons is what is used by what by the executive organ of government to directly enforce the law. Don't forget that. So you see how influential they are towards policies. Not only that, um, appoint, uh, sorry, appointment making functions. You see, sometimes it is the president. In fact, not even sometimes. At all times, the president has the ultimate right to appoint ministers, directors, some cabinet, most cabinet positions. And in doing so, he he, he appoints those in his interest. Those who think can better serve it is he can follow his own mandate and policies. So, if the president decides not to appoint people who knows about policy, how many policy will he institute? Think about it. Again, we have uh, another function which is treaty making functions. He said it is the responsibility of the executive to decide as to which treaties are to be signed with other countries. The executive negotiates the treaties in accordance with the procedure defined by international law. It is the responsibility of the executive to go and sign treaties, despite the fact that these treaties also need to be, be, be approved by the legislature, but they have a very long way to go. So you see, so if the treaty they are going to sign is not going to benefit Singapore, or is something that they are not in favor of as a government, it is not going to actually work. So you see. Let's see what happens. Another function of the executive is that it has a lot of it has to defend war and peace functions. You see that? For example, using the army, they can defend the country both from internal and external attack. And during peace functions, they can also go and negotiate. For example, see them to peace, peace, uh, peace talks. You know, like what happened in Somalia. We sent most of our military men from Syria for a peacekeeping force.
That is their responsibility. You know, foreign policy making and the conduct of foreign relations. You see that? This policy making, when we want to bring out a foreign policy, I told you that they have influence. The government must be the world, those to do that. They will have to agree or disagree. If, for example, the government decide that this policy, even though it is in the interest of the people, but we don't want it, definitely it will not work. So power, <laughs> politics has direct influence to that of what policies. So that is why initially, if you can listen well, I did say that the influence that the government in power determines which policies to be formulated. And the policy that does not go with the agenda is not formulated. Think about it. So, and the success of a government is determined by its policies. If the policies are strong, they are bound to succeed. If the policies are weak, you already know the answer. And other function of the executive is policy making. That one is not a secret. They make policies. They pass policies. You know, in fact, some ministers can sit down. And for, for example, let's say the Ministry of Housing and Infrastructure. The Ministry of Housing and Infrastructure can decide to draft a policy on homelessness, on housing, or the construction of houses for all those who are homeless and send it to Parliament. If government decides to support it, they will decide to actually form that policy and begin to build houses for those who are homeless. But I think we are far from that yet. So we see these are the things you have to think of. You know, lawmaking under the system of delegated legislation, I, okay, we are not coming to understand that. Now, the system of delegated legislation has considerably increased the lawmaking role of the executive. When we talk about delegated legislation, it is telling us that parliament is responsible for the formulation of law. But sometimes parliament can be so busy, or sometimes there are certain laws because of lack of expertise. For example, parliament cannot make laws on roads. <laughs> How many of those parliamentarians really know about road signs? They will now call on the Ministry of Transportation because they are dealing with transport and then decide to give them the responsibility of formulating laws that deal with transportation, road signs, etc. After making those laws, they will now send them to parliament and parliament will approve. So you see how dedicated legislation has actually gone. Parliament, because of time, or because of expertise, or because of one reason or the other, will decide to delegate, hand over, sub subject their responsibility to the executive organ. And the executive organ then will now perform that function and it can be approved by parliament. But it has to be approved by parliament, you see. So all these influences policies. You see that? I want you to be thinking out of the box. Now, of course, financial functions, <laughs> I've said that. If the executive organ, uh, it, it has to, uh, the mandate to, 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 it has the mandate of uh, ensuring that it prepared budget. And if the executive or the government is not in favor of a particular policy, in preparing the budget, they may exclude that policy, who is going to fund it. So we have to think about it. A lot of other functions can be seen in the way. Uh, let's move to the judiciary. Of course, there are many functions performed by the judiciary. Among them, we have, um, we said the primary role of the judiciary is to interpret laws and policies and punish lawbreakers. Say, for example, Parliament has passed a policy that has to do with hands off a gun, stating that all those who have committed, who commit a crime of rape, should be sentenced for 15 years in prison. Now, now rape a 10-year-old girl and Pa Abu is taken to court. The responsibility of the judiciary is to look at that particular provision and now interpret it that Pa Abu, on so so date, a policy was passed which says that you should take your hands off your guards. And so, raping is 15 years imprisonment. They are interpreting exactly what was passed in parliament. And after the interpretation of that one, definitely, but they will not say, according to that, you are you are liable to be sentenced to 15 years in prison. They just interpreted and they hand over to the prison officer. So this is how people are sentenced. So the primary role of the judiciary is to ensure that they interpret the law and punish law breakers. The judiciary, through expert judges, can formulate laws in the form of a judicial prison. Certain cases go to court. But unfortunately, 
have not got provisions in the Constitution. For example, um, actually, let me give you an example of an Okada or a vehicle. Let's say the law says a vehicle must have license. All vehicles must have license. And automatically, a guy with an Omolango was passing in the street. And he was now arrested by a police officer that where is your license? And definitely, the man does not have a license. And he's taken to court. But the constitution or the laws does not make provision for uh, Omolangi. Maybe it only says vehicle, but does not specify what a vehicle is. It's now left with what? The ideas, the knowledge of that judge to interpret whether an Omolangi is a vehicle or not. Now, what am I saying here? If the judge at this point decides that an Omolake is what? Is a vehicle. Then automatically any other case of sort nature, Omolakis will be interpreted as what? As a vehicle. Judicial precedent. See that? Or case, these are what these are called case laws. See that? So we understand that. But if the judge on the other hand says no, vehicles cannot be interpreted as something that can take fuel. Not only that, but it has a driver, but can take passengers automatically. If that is the interpretation of the judge for a vehicle, then definitely Omolaki is not a vehicle. Any other case of something nature cannot follow this. This is how the judiciary or judges can make case laws, etc. It is the judiciary that has the fundamental goal of maintaining justice by becoming impartial and credible. Of course, that's why it's not a secret. Now, let me take you through the theoretical perspectives of various scholars in relation to politics, power, and let's relate it to policies. The first we are going to be looking at is the Plato's Philosopher King's Theory. Plato's Philosopher King's Theory. Now, a more analytical discussion on why Plato thinks that a ruler must also be a philosopher, or the necessity of a philosopher king in his ideal state. According to Plato, a philosopher has a rational mind, has the wisdom and virtue, has the knowledge and the only, and the only knows the idea of good and all these qualities make it to be good or to be the best ruler of the city state. However, since there is little possibility of philosophers, philosophers becoming rulers, Plato argues a ruler must also be a philosopher. <laughs> yeah. the, this will enable the ruler to govern his state in an ideal way. Very interesting. <laughs> what does Plato say? Somebody will say, Plato, <laughs> mind you, we are not political scientists. I'm just taking you through so that you can understand and from there I will relate it to policy. Let's leave that for the political scientists. <laughs> Plato is saying that um, in a state, it is either philosophers. When you talk about philosophers, those who are highly educated, those who, who can think ahead of time, those with a vast experience, those with knowledge, those with understanding, he said those we call philosophers must become leaders. And not stop there, he said, since it is impossible for those who are philosophers to become leaders, those who are leaders must try to become also philosophers. So it is either philosophers become kings or kings become philosophers. Let me critically examine or break it down. What was Plato really trying to say? Plato was saying that philosophers must become kings. Or kings must become philosophers, or the leadership of the state will, will always be like that. He believed that it is only when those with knowledge take upon the governance of the states that we can be able to succeed. Because they will have to think beyond knowledge. They will have to think beyond the constitution. And they will have to take decisions that are better or that are better for the development of the state. But if you put people who are not philosophers and people who are not willing to learn, they will not be able to succeed. They will not be able to use their wisdom. They will always continue to retrogress the states. They will take us backward. They will not implement good policies. They... I don't know if you're understanding what Plato, the angle he was coming from. Let me continue. Well, Plato was very, very much emphatic in this. And according to Aristotle, he said, Aristotle, 
Plato's disciple also argued that it will be better for a ruler to be world, uh, worldly wise than to be wise in the world of ideas. See the contradictions? But one thing I want you to know about Plato's idea was that politicians should not take things for granted. Politicians should become philosophers. They should be wise. They should, be, they should understand. They should have knowledge. They should have wisdom. They must study philosophy before they become leaders. Or if they are not philosophers, we are assuming the throne, they must ensure that they become philosophers. They, they, they philosophize. Only that will they be able to succeed. Plato's philosopher kings also have a different parameter. He used a different ideologies to explain and to expand his knowledge for better understanding. But for all, our interest is Plato's view that philosophers will become king and kings will become philosophers. That is our own concern in this theory. And uh, why are we concerned? We are concerned because in relating to policies, only a leader, only a politician that understands, that have knowledge, that have wisdom, that know that is what that that is what uh, Plato called philosopher king. That leader will better institute better policies. That leader will be able to bring development. That leader will be able to bring laws that favor the state. That leader will be able to rule in the interest of the people. Mind you, Plato in his key philosopher king's theory maintained that the leader, if he has wisdom, will be able to rule and will be able to institute. Um, uh, concepts and policies that are even not in the constitution, but then that are better off for the welfare of the citizens. You see that? So we have to understand it from that perspective. And Plato's, Plato was very emphatic, being a student of Socrates. Now we move. Also, we are going to the Machiavellian perspective. For Machiavelli, in his book, The Prince, has always been emphatic in saying, he advised in his book, The Prince, so it's very popular. You know, sometimes when I talk about Machiavelli, people say Machiavelli is a, is a, is a, is a, is a very difficult scholar. He's a scholar who, 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 who does not look at things in the way people go. And I say, yes, he is always the opposite. And for Machiavelli, a man should not be too nice. <laughs> and in his book, the prince, he advised kings and princes. He advised the the prince on how he must rule. Look at what he said. First, let me tell you who Machiavelli is. Niccolo Machiavelli was born in 1469 and died in 1527. He was a Florentine writer and public official who is perhaps best known as the world's most foremost philosopher of, of power. In the following passage from the prince, he argues that a ruler who wishes to maintain power so not always be good. <laughs> sometimes people say, President Bio, he had this smiles. <laughs> and sometimes I say to myself, President Bio is a Machiavellian. <laughs> he does not, you know, people who are serious do not smile all the time. How can people be smiling at all times and say they are comedians? Let me tell you, for Machiavelli, a leader who wants to maintain power should not be too, should not be good at all times. People should not be saying, he is a nice man, he is a good man. You have to bring tough policies tough approaches, tough measures that can bring development to the country. So therefore, Machiavelli was right upon Wednesday that indeed the leader should not be too good. Now, he said, it, is now, it now remains to, to show in what manner a prince should behave to his subjects and friends. This matter, having been already discussed by others, it may seem arrogant in me to pursue it further. You see that sometimes people have discussed it, and to me, if I continue to emphasize, people may think, this guy, what is he saying? You know? But I want you to understand the angle I'm coming from. It's not me, it is Machiavelli. You see that? Now, when I look at this, I've been following or doing research to understand why really Machiavelli said so. And let me surprise you. Some other analysts and scholars also made reference to the fact that, indeed, even in life, the man who is too nice, the man who is too good, will not succeed. The man who is too nice will not, will not be able to achieve. Because you want people to praise you at all times, because you want people to always say he's a nice man, you will not be able to take tough decisions. You will not be able to bring better policies. You will not be even a manager in an office. And that affects your growth as an individual. Scholars have said, some says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth was a very nice man. And see what happens. 
Because he was a nice man, look at how they treated him. They, they blocked him so much to the extent, beat him and hang him on the cross, disgraced him. I was following um, an analyst who was busy asserting that as far as he's concerned, Jesus Christ is the greatest loser. Because that Jesus Christ allowed himself to be beaten. He allowed himself because he was a nice man. So anybody who allowed people to be to, to call him a nice man or a good man will always generate himself to mock him. You know, so Machiavelli was right in that direction, and that is why you are always maintain do evil that good may come, but I saw that the good that comes surpasses the evil. <laughs> what does that mean? That you should always ensure that anything that is evil that you are going to do for it to succeed, you must do it. But ensure that when you do that evil, the good that comes after the evil must be more than the evil you have done. To a very large extent, I tend to agree. So. And how do we relate this to policy? If you are a leader and you want to succeed politically, you have to ensure that the policy you bring are tough. Hands of our God is a very tough policy. Now, people may say, when they marry, let them suggest him. They may begin to look at it from several angles, but to me, I support because but they are saying, is a harsh policy, the leader was tough enough, you know, that is what is what we need. We need robust policies, we need tough measures, we need, and that is a Machiavellian. You should not be too nice. President Bill, don't look at them, but just continue doing what you're doing. At least I'm behind you. The Machiavellian principle must prevail. However, go. Um, he said, Thus, a good man and one who wishes to prove himself in all aspects must be undone in a contest which so many are evilly disposed. A prince who wishes to maintain his power ought, therefore, to learn that he should not be always good. You see that? Anybody who wants to maintain power should, be, should not be too good. Anybody who wants to progress should not be too good. Anybody who wants to succeed in life should not be too good. So that's why it's a why it's Even in your family issue, family, if you are too good, family will always continue to bring the problems to you. I am hungry. Somebody said it's aching. I want to go to the hospital. You will be spending money. And you are going to get poorer and poorer the more. I'm not long said so. Check scholastic opinions. Well, if you are a bad man, you will continue to be richer and richer and richer and richer. <laughs> why, why is it? So I think I am beginning to judge between the two, which perspective I'm going to follow anyway. Let's look at Thomas Hobbes and his moral and political philosophy. Thomas Hobbes' moral and political philosophy was very good assertion. For Thomas Hobbes, He's an English philosopher, Thomas Hobbes. He was born in 18, in 15, 18, 1888, sorry, and died in 1679. He's best known for his political thought and deserve, deserving this rule. His vision of the world is strictly original and still relevant to contemporary politics. His main concern in is the problem of social and political order, how human beings can live together in peace and avoid the danger of fear of civil conflict. You see, I like that. For Thomas Hobbes, in his moral and political philosophy, his concern was how individuals can live in peace, how individuals can live in harmony, how individuals society can be stable, and for him, the only way society can be stable is when we have a government, when we have laws, when we have society policies, when we have better, and for him, a society without rules and regulations. A society without a government, a society without super policy will result to what Thomas Hobbes called brutish, nasty, solitary, rubbish, etc. So, it, it, you know, we was right, you know, politically, if we are to succeed, I'm sure we must follow. We must have better laws, we must have better policies, we must have better... So we begin to relate it back from a theoretical framework and realize that Plato was right. A wise man was ascending to become king. And in one day, to me, I believe if we are to succeed, someone with knowledge must ascend with, uh, with presidency. And for that of Machiavelli, he was also right to say that a man should not be too nice. Indeed, in bringing it to this concept, we must bring tough policies. Not Let us not be taking good places. He's a nice man. Let us bring policies that are better off for the people, that could maintain, that could help them shape their mindset. And for Thomas Hobbes, he was also right to say that indeed a society without laws, rules, and regulation will result to anarchy, 
booties, nasty, bored, solitary, etc. I am also in support of that. So therefore, we need good laws, we need better policies. And this, that is why polit politics, power, has direct influence on this. Now, as I conclude, I want you to have it in mind that politics is a struggle for political power, and it is politics that makes power possible, and this power forms a government, and this government has a direct and indirect influence on policies, in as much as it has the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. Without a government, policies cannot be effective, though we have official actors of policies, such as the media, such as the political group, such as civil societies, such as uh, uh, religious groups. These are unofficial actors, but the, the government has a lot to play. And even, the, even, the, 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 even with the influence of the unofficial actors, without official actors, that is the government, society, societal policies will not be formulated. So the influence of the government towards policies, the influence of power and politics towards policies cannot in any way be overemphasized. Thank you very much for your attention and God bless. End of lectures.